Hi, I'm Morgan Evans, Technical Specialist for Autodesk. Welcome to this webinar session today for motion graphics and a whole lot more looking at the new features in Maya that we've had over the last year. Today I'm going to be covering obviously motion graphics predominantly, but the whole lot more part is going to be looking at all of the other uses that we can use this procedural instancing system for. So this comes in the form of MASH, our motion graphics tool set for Maya. So we'll be taking an in-depth look at the different things that we can use this for, such as modeling, rigging, all sorts of interesting effects that previously in Maya would have taken some R&D time, some extra resources, but now we can achieve quite complex results in a very short space of time. Let's take a look at some of the uses for MASH in a bit more detail. As you'd expect, motion graphics is what the tool was originally written for, so this is what it does in a very efficient manner. So it's perfect for things like creating heads-up displays. There's a few examples of that here, so if you imagine your spaceship panels, for example. And it's also great at things like your TV ident work. So new to my 2018 is the whole new Dynamics toolset. We'll be looking at this in a bit more detail, but it deals with very large numbers of instances in a highly efficient manner. It's also good as a modeling tool. For example, this chain mail was done using in the MASH to position all the chain links. And this forest was also done using the MASH toolset. So it's great for dealing with modeling and but it's also good for behaviors as well so it has all sorts of built-in nodes for movement so this is a signal node for example we can take the output of our mesh network and use it to drive anything in Maya so this extrude node is taking advantage of the audio coming out of your mesh network it's perfect for things like rigging so this tank tread was done using mesh and even this robot eye rig was done using mesh as well so it gives the animator real interactive feedback for what they're trying to create so later in the webinar, we'll also be taking a look at the world node. So this is the ability to be able to essentially simulate a forest from, from scratch using different genotypes for your different types of trees that you would want to populate your landscape with. So before we go into MASH and look at some of that tool set in a bit more detail, I first of all wanted to focus a little bit on this 3D type tool and see how we could create something like this uh, alphabet blocks in a very short space of time. So the 3D type tool lives on our MASH tool shelf. And we can do all the basics that you would expect out of a 3D type tool, such as change the fonts, the font size, the tracking. We can even use our type manipulator tool to individually go in and move the letters independently of each other. And you see that it automatically shifts everything downstream of it from left to right. So one of my favorite parts about the 3D type tool is the generator tab. So this is a dynamic way of being able to update the text that you would see. So whether you want it to be the frame number, we can change it to generate the time, the scene time. Then you can choose the number of decimal places and all, all sorts of things. So we can uh, generate letters randomly, and numeric random values as well, but we can also uh, animate the text. So we can either cycle through uh, words that we input here randomly, or we can actually animate it based on a frame number. So if I uh, go new and I just type in a few different words here. So in this case, I'm going to type in motion graphics rocks. And we're going to assign a different frame number for each word to appear on. So basically that word will appear until the next word is triggered. So if we go back to animated text mode here and scrub over the timeline, you'll see we get our motion graphics rocks. Now the other neat part about the generator is it has a Python mode as well. So I've just put in a simple bit of Python code here to randomly cycle through an ASCII lowercase alphabet. And if I just go in and modify this and type in uppercase instead, you'll see that it's modified that instantly. So the other nice part about the 3D type tool is it has this whole geometry tab. So in there, you can do things like decide whether geometry needs to be deformable. 
you can go in and modify the extrusion options as well. So you have all sorts of profile curves to do this. You can choose a number of extrusion subdivisions. But one of my favorite tabs in here is actually the uh, bevel option. So in there you have all sorts of profile curves. There's presets already uh, predetermined. So you can see we can get some pretty nice results there on the text. And we can even go in and edit this ourselves if we want to start pulling points around and get into the finer detail. And then once we're done with this, of course, we can save this out as a preset very easily as well. So now we're going to go into our MASH network. I'm going to distribute these at the moment that's set to linear. I can, of course, go in and play around with the settings here. So we can change it to radial if we want to. But in order to achieve that block, um, I don't want it as a grid. I want to actually use the mesh mode to position these objects which will ultimately make up the sides of my wooden blocks. So I've got a cube in the scene. I'm going to middle click and drag this over to my input mesh on the distribute node in, Ma in MASH. So at the moment it's defaulting to vertex, but if I change it to face center in the mesh settings of the distribute node, we can, we can do that as well. So I've applied a color node to this now. And within the color node, I'm changing the random hue, which is what's giving me a different color for each side of that text object. And what's great is at the moment, because this is live linked to my text generator, as I cycle through the different letters, you can see that it's still updating. So it's keeping that live link between the initial text that I created and the MASH network. So what we can do now, so say we want to actually create some geometry out of this for use further down the line. Say I want to create an entire alphabet of these letters and save them out as individual objects. How would I go about achieving this? So if we go back into our type tool here and we go back to the generator, we can see that this time I'm just going to modify that Python code slightly. So instead of being random, I'd like it to actually use the current time, so the slider time, and um, apply the letter of the alphabet based on the frame number. So obviously frame zero corresponds to A, frame one to B, and so on. So as I scrub through the timeline now, you'll see that we're actually in order instead of it being random. So this is all done through the type generator. And then from here, we can do some basic Python to just go through a, uh, a for loop so that for each frame, I just want it to simply duplicate and freeze out the text. So that would give me um, my entire alphabet of um, block letters, which then I could then use for whatever purpose I need or, or apply that to a MASH network. So there's our working alphabet. We've talked about using MASH as a modeling tool, so I wanted to look at some of the basic uses for that here, really just in terms of multiplying objects and instancing them in a very simple, efficient manner. So all I'm doing here at the moment is simply just uh, choosing a couple of edge loops that I'd like to convert to NURBS curves and then use those NURBS curves to help me position some rivets around this jet engine that we've got here. So I'm just making some adjustments to my rivet here but then I'm going to use the MASH network to procedurally instance these and start to place them using the curves they already have in place. So we've got the um, MASH network set up here. We've selected our instances and we've got a few different modes for placing them. So we've got radial, linear, we've got a grid mode for placing our instances. But what we're interested in doing is actually placing these along our NURBS curves that we've already created along our jet engine. So to do this, we would add an additional node to our MASH network. So we'd add a curve node. We're going to remove any animation from that because we don't want our instances to move. We just want to place them in this case. So we're going to drag and drop our NURBS curves over to the input curve section of our curve node in MASH. So we can do this by middle clicking and dragging over from the outliner. And you'll see that each NURBS curve that I've added has now started to place those rivet instances along each curve. So we're going to up the number of points considerably. So then it's going to basically divide our total number of instance points across all of the curves evenly. 
And now we've got a nicely set up number of rivets on our jet engine. Now where MASH really comes into its own is actually keeping this essentially a live link between your original object and your instances. And what we're going to do now is create some propellers. So I've set up a second MASH network here. I'm going to, using the distribute node, set this to radial. And we're going to up the number of points so we have slightly more of our propellers, but it doesn't look great right now. So what we need to do is go in and start to use some deformers on that original propeller. So I've chucked in a twist deformer. And then we can play around with the shape of that individual propeller. So we can put a flare on there as well to widen it slightly at the top. Now what is really nice is that any of the deformers that you have on your original object will carry through to the instances. So this is stuff we've been able to do in Maya for a while, but in terms of actually positioning and handling the instances, this is what MASH is particularly clever and efficient at doing. So when we're happy with this, we can rerun our MASH network. We can switch this to radial as, radial as before, up the number of points, and we start to have something that looks a little bit more like the propellers you'd expect to see on a jet engine. So we've added a transform node to this in MASH now, which allows us to then position the entire MASH network more appropriately. And what we'll see, as I mentioned before, is that because we have this live link between our original object with the deformers, any changes we make will propagate through the instances in the MASH network. Now you can start to populate with any other objects now and help to position these very quickly and easily using a similar process. So you duplicate them radially with your distribute node in MASH and then add a transform node to position these very quickly and easily. So you can see here, we can very quickly add all of this extra detail to our jet engine in a simple and efficient manner. And this is all simply being done through the distribute node at the moment, which is kind of the heart of your MASH network for positioning your instances. Now where it gets interesting, so I've actually got about five or six different varieties of pipes here, all taking up different positions. And if I duplicate these, I can add something called an ID node in MASH. Now what the ID node allows me to do is say I've got 10 different varieties of pipes set up to begin with, the ID node can randomly place those instances. So what we want to do now is actually give some variety. So at the moment, they're all pointing to ID zero. But by adding this ID node in MASH, once we've positioned them, we can then start to get some random variety based on our original selection of objects. I go back to my MASH editor, add the ID node, and then we want to basically take a random selection here. So as we change the cycle, you can see that our pipes are now getting some variety in there. So you can, you can add some random detail to your instances. So where it's also very useful is you can use things like Arnold stand-ins to really cut down the render time. So all this extra detail, like this canister here, we're just putting on a couple of basic Arnold shaders. So we've got the car paint. We've got a metallic car paint as well if we want to add a bit more detail again. And then once we're done with this, we can actually save this out as an Arnold stand-in and the MASH network will also understand your Arnold stand-in. So it really cuts down on render time. And the viewport even has an Arnold stand in preview mode, so you can actually get a feel for the geometry in the viewport as well. But in terms of render data efficiency, using the Arnold stand in through the MASH instance network saves you a lot of time when it comes to rendering. So my background was uh, rigging. And through this, I wanted to show an example of how you could use MASH uh, for rigging uh, a vehicle, for example. So I've got this robot character here, and there's several elements that are using MASH in this example. 
So I did a simple uh, vehicle rig. So this is just using a basic Maya expression to take the Z transform of that main control and drive the rotation of those curves. So I've got one tank tread, which I'm duplicating using the uh, mash network again. So using the distribute node, I'm going to up the quantity to about 22, which I just happen to know is the number I'm after for my tank treads. And then I'm going to add a curve node to this network. So using that curve, I'm going to middle click again and drag this over to the input curve section of the curve node. And then by increasing the step, you can see that it's populated those tank treads on there. They're linked to time by default. But I'm going to actually break that connection and use the output of my little expression to connect that. You see I had a bit of a weird flip there. I'm just going to focus on that quickly. I've got uh, a secondary curve next to each of those tank treads, which will act as an aim curve to lock down the up vectors. So as we move it forward and back now, you see one of them is already hooked up and linked to that forward motion and is working. So the way we would do that is to break the time on my curve node. And then using the node editor, I'm going to take the output rotation in X from my, my little expression driven wheel that I already set up. And I'm going to plug that into the time node and just tweak the animation value slightly to either speed it up or slow it down. So the other item that is a mash uh, network in this scene is actually the rivets on the wheels as well. So these are again just using the radial, radial um, distribution on the mash network. So I've got my single rivet. I'm just going to create another mash network here. I'm going to distribute it radially. I'm going to put about 10 or 12 of them in. And then I've got some locators in the scenes which uh, represent the pivots of each wheel, uh, which are already hooked up and constrained. So they're spinning with the um, wheel rig that I set up. And I can use them as a transform with a transform node in MASH to relocate that MASH network to, to sit in the correct place. So we'll see here that the rivets are now moving correctly. So finally, with this robot, I wanted to take a look at a bit of robot facial rigging. And, and how would you go about this? And how would the animators work with something like this in the Maya scene? So there's several mesh elements that make up that display. So first of all, I'm going to look at the uh, Adobe Illustrator import that we can do with the SVG node in Maya. So this is on the MASH tool shelf as well. So we can actually import vector graphics directly into our Maya scene. I'm going to set up a new MASH network to represent my kind of charging display that we've got there above the fuel gauge. So I've just got one plane that I'm duplicating and through the distribute node again, I'm just playing around with the scale. And then we're going to animate the step strength of this scale to give us that charging up and down effect. So this is kind of stage one of that display that we saw on the uh, robot. And the nice thing is because I created this mesh network in mesh mode, I can then deform this if I want to. So ultimately I want to use this as a fall off object further down the line. So what I'm going to do is just transform that node using a little locator there above the fuel gauge and then stick a bend deformer on there so it conforms to the surface underneath. So this is just to get it sitting a little bit tighter to the surface that I'll ultimately be using to generate that kind of pixel based display. So to do that, I just have a single small tiny plane in the scene. I'm going to duplicate that and in the distribute node using mesh mode, I'm going to distribute those um, per vertex, which will give me essentially a display. So if you think of each of these little planes or instance planes as a pixel of my display. So applying a color node here, I'm going to have a foreground color of blue, a little bit of a random hue on there, which if we dial that up and down, you can see it adds almost like a bit of a static effect. 
and then I'm going to apply a background color of black. Now this is where the fall off objects in MASH come in very handy. By default, we get an implicit sphere. So you can see as I move that sphere around, it's, it's changing the color from black to blue with a soft fall off. But I can actually apply a uh, mesh to that fall off object. So using that initial mesh network with the fuel gauge, that's what I'm going to be using as a fall off. So based on its proximity to those instance planes, it's going to change the color. So in the additional settings there, I was just turning down the uh, soft fall off there, which essentially feathers out the uh, fall, fall off object. So you see, we've done the first part of our display there very quickly and easily. And again, using the step strength, I can create this kind of dissolve effect. And then I can move into the next part of my display, which is actually a very simple blend shape driven eye rig on some NURBS curves. So I'm using that very uh, age old joystick style controller now in the eyes. And we're going to use each of those NURBS curves as two individual fall off objects on a brand new color node. And again, I'm just going to go to additional settings and shrink down the custom um, radius, which is like the fall off essentially. And you see that as I'm animating that now, it's updating the color on each of those pixels as the NURBS curves move around. So really, this is a great way of giving your animators very good real-time interactive feedback when they're trying to animate with items inside of MASH. And just to finish it off, I've got a 3, 2, 1, go. So I'm just using the 3D type tool again. I'm going to put some basic animation on there and just sit them on top of the, uh, the pixels that I've already set up to finish off the display. And that's pretty much the finished article. And this is it rendered off in Arnold. So we just put a simple glass shader piece of geometry above that display to give us that kind of TV look and feel. And just quickly, while we're looking at that Arnold render, I also wanted to talk about how you can work with MASH color node in your render engine or, or your renderer rather. So the way you would do this is actually to go into the shape for your mesh and under your Arnold tab, you would need to apply uh, the color per vertex data. So you've got expert export vertex colors as a tick box in your Arnold tab. And then once you've done this, there's a utility node in Arnold, which you would need to then apply to the color of your Arnold shader, which is the user color pool. And you would have to apply a color set to that. So by default, this just gets put on the standard color set with the American spelling. And then once you've done that, you can see our eyes are then starting to show up because that um, per vertex color information is then being carried on through your chain. So that is what is necessary to get your render looking correct uh, with the color node in, in MASH. So the next up is the placer node. So this was a big addition to my 2017 update three. And this is the ability to essentially art direct where you'd like your instances to go. So we've got 16 varieties of tree there. And we're going to set up a new mesh network with those all selected. And then we're going to add the, the new placer node from the mesh editor here. So you see we've added the placer node there. And it has a little paintbrush icon at the top. And you see, as I'm painting there, they're all the same at the moment. Now, this is simply because uh, it's the instances in MASH are ID driven. So if I change the ID from 0 to 1, you'll see it's giving me a different tree. Or I put 2, it's going to give me a different tree again. But what I can do to cycle between different trees, I can change it to random and then change the ID value from 0 to 16, which was the total number of items I had selected. So that as I then go to paint these, you can see it's giving me a different tree. And there's also a scatter mode, so we can then give ourselves a much bigger brush and, and increase the scatter density. And you'll see that we can then really start to create more of a forest kind of look. So if we make the brush much bigger, you can see we're starting to, to get this looking a bit nicer. Now, I imagine you're all probably looking at this thinking, yes, that's all well and good, but they're colliding with each other and we don't want that. So we also have a collide brush as part of this placer tool. So as you paint with the collide brush, 
you'll see that the trees magically move apart. And some very clever stuff going on in the background here, I'm assured by uh, Ian Waters, the um, mainframe developer who created this. And then the other thing we can do here, uh, if we just delete these ones, we can also have the collision set up as we are painting these. So there is a collide on create option here as well. So you see here that the trees are avoiding each other as we paint them. So the other thing we can do, if we want to perhaps create a river through here, we can just obviously put the delete brush on there. And so it gives you a huge amount of control um, and you can run this in either instancer mode or mesh mode. I would advise using the instancer mode when you set this up. And the nice thing we have here with the manipulate tool, the move tool for the placer as well, is you can go in and actually select each individual instance as well and move them about. So the final thing with the um, placer I want to focus on was the align to brush function, which as we paint here, you see instead of all facing the same way, it actually tries to follow the direction of the cursor as we move it along. So the next thing I wanted to focus on is the world node in MASH. So again, this was a, a brand new one to my 2017 update three. So it's pretty recent. And this is actually a clustering system. Uh, so we're just distributing here linearly. And what clustering means is it basically allows you to create additional instances around your originals, if you like. So I've created a duplication of five there. And you can see here that it's clustering around them. But the nice thing about the world node is that it also tries to um, avoid uh, with collision when you're increasing the number of, of items clustering around each point. So there's lots of different modes. There's a circle mode, there's a disk mode. And you can see here that as we move, even with the distribute node back and forth, they try to kind of self avoid each other there. So obviously great for things like frog spawn and caviar, raspberries, that sort of thing. But obviously I've just got some spheres here, but you could use this for all sorts of uh, different uses. So the moment you see we've got a bit of collision there. So we just go in, we're going to uh, up the separation distance a bit, going to up the collision iterations. And you'll see they start to then avoid each other much, much better. So next up is probably one of the most impressive parts of the world node. So at the very bottom of the uh, cluster mode, we have terrestrial ecosystem. So what this allows us to do is essentially simulate the growth of a forest, which is, uh, I think it was the amalgamation of about six different SIGGRAPH papers kind of allowed this tool to become a creation. So we drag and drop our landscape into the input mesh. So you can see that the trees are just sitting now on the mesh. And then based on our original uh, section of trees, we can set up using the genotype editor, a different genotype for each tree. So what we mean by that is that we get a, uh, we would choose a maximum age of each tree. We would choose the seed age, um, the soil type, the moisture content, the slope threshold, which would determine how well the tree would grow based on the height in Y of, of, of our landscape. So you, are, you can basically give your different trees a different uh, behavior based on these genotype settings. So you essentially set your ecosystem age. So you'd say, well, I want it to run over 100 years, and this is what it's going to look like. So you see that as we add the different genotypes with different attributes applied in the genotype editor, you can see that they're populating different parts of that mesh procedurally based on those genotype settings. So you see that as we tinker around with the values and the quantity and the age of our ecosystem, you see that it's starting to heavily populate uh, our landscape there with our forest. And again, you can go in and tweak the separation values as well to help avoid uh, collisions. And the nice thing you can do as well here in terms of the art directability of this um, is you can also, using the RGB values on a map, you can paint where you 
you want the trees to be visible or not. So you can see here that as we uh, do a bit of painting there on the mesh, it's just cleared out some of the trees there in the middle. So even though obviously it's a procedural system and it essentially is simulating the forest, we can um, churn through this and um, do a lot of art directing as well in terms of where we want the trees to go. And obviously this is just the world node we're looking at now and you can mix and match this with all the other nodes that we have available to us in MASH. So you can really get creative with the look and behaviors of your instances. So next up, we're on to the uh, fun stuff in MASH, which is the new Dynamics node that was applied to Maya 2018. So to kick that off, I have a really nice short video that the mainframe team have put together. Um, I believe it was uh, a very collaborative effort up in the Manchester office. And it really does show off the sorts of things we can now do in MASH with Dynamics. So Dynamics in MASH is using the uh, bullet solver but it's MASH's implementation of the bullet solver, which is far more efficient than anything else out there on the market at the moment. Um, stuff that would have previously crashed in Maya um, just through stress testing and quantity. So 70,000 cubes, for example, uh, all colliding together can now be dealt with um, seamlessly using this new version of uh, the bullet solver in MASH. So let's take a look at their short film. And just below, uh, you see I have bash movie links. So the best part about this is that the mainframe guys have actually shared the scene files for their bash uh, short movie, which will be rolling in a second. And I've got the links available at the bottom there if you want to either view the tutorials of how they did it, um, download the scene files. Um, so I've got the movie links at the bottom here while I roll the video, and I'll also be showing them at the end uh, of this webinar today. Cool. So I think that's a lot of fun there and you can, it gives you uh, some imagination as to the sorts of things you can do. So as I said a second ago, we have access to the scene files so you can go in there, you can dissect them and you can just have a lot of fun really just seeing how these scenes are put together and then start to play around with the values, play around with the MASH networks and it's a great learning resource. So a big thank you to the mainframe guys for sharing that with us. So that is available on their uh, mainframe uh, MASH Vimeo channel. Uh, there's a link to it on there. And as I said before, there's a link at the bottom of uh, the movie here, and we'll be showing it again at the end. So just an example of how uh, some of the items are put together in that movie. You can see here that this is that uh, pipes example there, so the balls that were falling into the pipes. So the way we would put something like that together would be, uh, you'd start off obviously with your distribute node there linearly, and I've got some spheres in the scene as well, which I've just applied a bit of dynamics to those just by adding the dynamics node, and that's all I've done. I've just set up a mesh network, added dynamics node, and they just fall to the ground. So we're adding um, a transform to our spheres here with a second mesh network. I'm going to add a dynamics node to that as well. So as soon as I do that, you'll see that they will also fall with the pipes. And the nice thing is, because it's all being run through the same bullet solver, even though it's two separate mesh networks, you'll see that they interact with each other. So they kind of fell into the pipes there. So what we can then do with our pipes to get them to behave a bit differently, we can add uh, something called constraints within the um, MASH Dynamics node. 
And you saw there that all the pipes then fell at the same time because they were essentially linked together. So if we go into our constraint settings, we can see that there's all sorts of different modes here, whether it's glue or spring. You can see you can choose the connection points as well. So you can do some really crazy stuff. You can add ramps to this as well. And uh, Ian Waters on the mainframe channel has some fantastic dynamics videos, which you should check out after today. But what we can do as well, we can actually limit the behavior of these attachment points. So if I just go back slightly, um, I've changed the connection point to an offset value and I'm setting it to minus one. So that's essentially giving me a pivot point there from the bottom of the pipes. And then in the uh, limits section, we can choose to perhaps lock a couple of axes and keep one limited. So I'm limiting one of them to 180 in X and I'm locking the others so that as the balls fall in there, then they're starting to only rotate um, on the single axis. Now what's neat obviously being MASH is that once you've messed around with that behavior linearly, I've changed my distribute node to grid now and they're gonna run that again with the dynamics all live so this is the finished article, which again is available on, on the uh, bash scene files. So just to look at a few more dynamics examples, as that was the big one for 2018. We're setting up a grid here. We're introducing a bowl. And we're just hitting play and that's the results. So you would add a bowl. You go to your bullet solver that gets created there. You drag and drop the bowl from your outliner as a collider. And that's literally all it takes to do dynamics in MASH. And then of course you can play around with all the usual dynamic settings such as um, the friction, the bounce amount, the rolling friction. So you have a lot of control over the behavior. And something important to mention actually is that in your dynamics node, uh, there's several different ways that it can work out the collisions for your objects as well. So you can add um, uh, either just have it as bounding box mode, you can have it as a capsule mode, you can have convex hull, which is the best compromise uh, for getting it close enough to the mesh. Convex hull basically means it will do everything apart from objects which have holes in them like a torus. Um, and the other mode is mesh mode. So if you want the 100% accurate collisions, you can do that. Obviously you would see a speed hit at that point. So this is just taking a look at how you can constrain the bricks and work with them in different ways. So we've got interactive playback on there. And you can choose how the bricks are essentially glued together and how they and how much they they stick. And this is an interesting one as well, which we'll be looking at a sort of practical example for this in a second. This is actually a combination of dynamics and our placer node. So if you have interactive playback turned on, and you use the placer node, you can see that as we're clicking away there with the interactive playback turned on, you can start to just pile up objects. So it's fantastic for things like landscapes, junkyards, that kind of thing. And it gives you a real nice random approach. So using Dynamics as well, I wanted to show how you can get it to interact with other parts of um, the MASH network. So we've got some dominoes here. So we've just got a simple bit of animation on our sphere. So we've got a mesh network with the dominoes with dynamics node added. You see there that I'm not quite close enough. So I'm gonna go back to distribute node, bring them a bit closer together. Whoops, not enough friction. So we're gonna turn up the friction a little bit on the dynamics node and rerun that. So there's our domino, super easy to set up. And then if we do something like add a curve node in mesh, we can see then that we can increase the number of points along the new curve. So we've dragged and dropped a NURBS curve uh, into the input curve of our curve node. And again, the dynamics just works. So we can, we can combine this um, with other curves as well. So if we wanted to introduce a second curve into the mix here, we can do that simply by adding an additional curve to our curve node. 
So we're going to pop a little brick there underneath. That's going to be a collider. And then I'm going to draw a second curve. I'm going to drag and drop that curve from my outliner into the original curve node that I set up in that mesh network. So you see I've dragged a second one over there, middle click. And then I'll have to increase the points again now um, on the distribute node because obviously it stretches them out over the two curves. And then if I just run that simulation again, you'll see that the two curves will essentially interact or the two paths will interact with each other because it's all still using the same dynamics node. But this is what we're talking about with the simplicity and the art directability of MASH. I mean, it's so easy to use and a lot of fun. So another example of the two MASH networks interacting with each other here, we're just adding a grid node, uh, sorry, a grid mode rather for the uh, distribute. We're going to add a, a random node here just to make them look a little less uniform, just with some very small values. And going to pop the dynamics onto that one as well. So we've got the two objects interacting with each other then. And then just to finish this off nicely, I'm going to add a color node as well to the second batch of dominoes. And something I didn't cover before is you can also add textures to your color node as well. So we've got the Maya logo. I'm going to load that quickly. And again, we're going to make sure that the uh, export vertex colors is ticked under the Arnold options to be able to allow our renderer to be able to pick up that color information. And this is just a very basic Arnold render of the end result. So I've just got Oh yeah, and then <laughs> forgot about this one. So I, I'm a big fan of the uh, the OK Go videos. I don't know if any of you've seen them on YouTube. It's a, a band, and they do these amazing elaborate uh, setups. So this is just one of the setups from uh, the OK Go video, which I wanted to see if I could replicate. So they just had this big kind of wooden plank, and uh, and it's actually pretty close. I was pretty happy with that. But the whole domino thing kind of got me got me thinking: uh, can can we achieve this in Mash? And of course, uh, with a bit of tinkering around, we can. So last up, I just want to look at a combination really of the different types of nodes. So using the placer node with the dynamics. Uh, so we saw that earlier for throwing those objects around. So I'm a dad, I've got two young kids. And of course, my kids' bedrooms never look this tidy. So I just wanted to kind of show how can we add some toys in here, make it look a bit messier. Um, and take advantage of things like the placer node and the dynamics node used in conjunction together. So I've set up a mesh network. I've added a placer node. Now there's a few things I had to tinker around with in the settings. Um, there's a push along normals function on the placer node. Now that does what you'd imagine. I'm painting on the floor there, but what's actually happening is it places them, say 100 units or 10 units, whatever you put in the value there above the floor. So what that allows the dynamics to do is to then be able to drop them uh, in place on the floor with the floor as a collider. So we'd add the floor as an input mesh for our placer. So just drag that over from the outliner. And I'm going to turn on convex hull mode um, on the dynamics because I've got lots of different shapes. I've got a load of toys uh, down at the origin, which I'm basically using in my network and I'm going to start chucking them around and I'm adding a few items as collider objects here so the tabletop the floor and then using the placer with dynamics I'm just basically dotting my objects all around the scene it starts to get a bit slower as we start to you know ramp up the values but it, it's a great way for you to be able to just chuck rubbish chuck you know random objects around the place and then, of course, if you want to, you can have this in mesh mode. You could bake this out or freeze out the mesh network. As I mentioned earlier with the place, you can actually select them as if they were individual objects. So as a parent, I like to at least be able to walk to the bed in my kids' bedrooms. So uh, I've asked them to tidy it up. 
and park them all off to the side. And that really just shows the flexibility of the mesh network that, you know, I'm using dynamics, but again, it's that art directability. So the nice thing is being interactive, instead of having it blocks, I've now switched it back to toys again. And this is just a quick look at it in Arnold. So you can see, you know, how quickly you can generate something that looks quite good, really, just by chucking objects around the scene. So it's a lot, it's a fun way to, to populate these types of uh, 3D scenes. So the other thing we can do here is switch these out for Arnold standards if we want to. So these are actually going back to those blocks that we created with the uh, 3D type tool early on. So I saved out some Arnold standings of those. And just showing you the different types of modes that you can do for your Arnold stand-in. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can go to the Arnold um, tab within the shape of any object and you can switch it to Arnold behavior as procedural and then point it to your Arnold stand-in as file. And then of course, the other way of importing your Arnold stand-ins is just through the standard, standing, uh, the standard create stand-in and then point it to your as file as well. So there's a couple of different ways of populating your, your um, mesh networks. So I'm just using that world mode again here with a bit of clustering. I've got it in bounding box mode at the moment with my Arnold stand-ins. And if I change the values in the uh, random settings there from 0 to 1, you can see that it's kept all those details that we got from the bevel and things like that from the 3D type earlier on in the webinar. So I think that leaves a little bit of time for questions now. Before I jump into that, I just wanted to say, if you want to download anything in terms of scene files and examples, you can go to our creative market, where on there, you can see we've got examples of the uh, Let's Play Outside that we saw earlier on. Uh, the other place to go is obviously the mainframe uh, Vimeo channel, where Ian Waters, the developer there, has put literally hundreds of MASH videos. So I've only been able to cram a certain amount into the hour today, but there's so many examples on there. There's the BASH um, movie on there as well. So thank you all for attending today. Um, I hope it's been a useful webinar. It's been a lot to get through, but as I said, we'll be putting out tons of resources um, over the coming weeks. Um, in a lot more detail so you can sit and watch in your own time. Uh, definitely check out the Vimeo channel from the mainframe guys. Um, Ian Waters just churns these videos out at an incredible speed. So a uh, big thank you to him for all of the information that he's sharing with us. Um, so thank you all for attending and I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you for our next webinar. Uh, my colleague, Alex Horst, is going to be doing a 3D Studio Max webinar in about a week's time. Uh, so check out our Meet the Experts landing page and uh, get yourselves registered for that one as well. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.